this morning obviously marks a very historic day in the life of our church, a day that began when I looked like that 30, 32 years ago. Yep, that was me. See what you've done to me? <laughs> 32 years ago, God blessed our lives to be able, hey, boy, it's so good to see you too. I've seen so many wonderful faces today that I haven't seen in so long, so thank you. Thank you for being here as well. But what a glorious day that we have to celebrate this historic day in the life of our church, where after 32 years as the senior pastor of our church, I get to close that season of my life. And maybe if you're visiting with us, you don't know how we got to that celebration and this historic moment in the life of our church so maybe it'll be good for me just to kind of rehearse that very briefly for you and for all of us just to celebrate the goodness of God and how we got here today a transition plan began in my heart about 10 years ago when I was away for an annual sabbatical which I take every year for a couple of weeks just to be away to pray to think and consider how and what the Lord might want to work in my life and the life of our church and so I came back after that sabbatical 10 years ago, and uh, the pastors and the elders who we would all meet together said, so what was on your mind? What did the Lord lay on your heart? What, what, what are you thinking about? And I said these words to them. The Lord made it very clear to me that I'm leaving. And it got very quiet around the table. And then I looked at each of those men, and I said, and you're leaving, and you're leaving, and you're leaving, and you're leaving. And you're leaving. We're all leaving. And the question is, when we go, what will we leave behind? What will we do to ensure that in that day, when we are gone, in whatever way that happens, what will it look like that we will still be the church that God planted, holding to the same glorious truths, worshiping the same great God? How will we do that? And so we put that in the back burner, and then we began to pray and think about what that would look like. And God, in his goodness and kindness, seven years ago, brought Zach and Brittany forward to our lives. And we didn't tell him when he came what the plan was. Uh, we knew God was calling him to be a senior pastor one day. And we watched him, and we observed him. And I'll never forget the day a few years ago when all the elders and pastors apart from Zach met, and I said, I think it's time. And they all agreed, we believe it's time. I'll never forget, we picked up the phone together as a group of elders. We called Zach, and I said, can you put your phone on speakerphone and, and bring Brittany to the phone? And each of those men went around and said that day, Zach, we believe that God is calling you to be our next senior pastor. And we would be delighted if you would do that. And so we began this process of working out what that would look like. And then in May of 2019, we presented to you a public document that clearly outlined the transitional plan and how that would go. And so now, after that whole process, we have arrived at this day to where you, by your overwhelming vote last Sunday, approved Zach to be our next, our second only senior pastor in the history of this church and for me to get to continue with you uh, as an associate for some years to come. You know, as I thought about that, I, I really wanted to say to you this morning, because of me ending this 32-year tenure of senior pastor, that doesn't mean that my ministry life is over, right? That doesn't mean that. I don't think that somehow there's a sell-by date stamped on my life right now, okay? <laughs> Still have many more years about that, and I'm excited to see what that looks like and what it will mean to be a part of this church as our senior pastor, Zach Ford, leads us forward. So obviously, as I come here after 32 years of ministry, there's just absolutely an impossible task before me this day. And that impossible task is to really show thankfulness and gratitude in so many ways for you and those who are here. There's going to be, after the service, a special opportunity for Zach and I to introduce publicly and formally our, our friends and families who are here because we want you to know them and how important they are in our lives. But though we couldn't do that without taking the whole entire service up today, I at least feel like publicly there's just several people I do need to mention here today. Obviously, at the top of the list would be my mom. Most of you don't know. Yeah.
Most of you don't know this part of my story, but my mom was the sole believer in our home as I grew up. Very difficult years for us, but she was the sole voice of the gospel in our home. And I thank you, Mom, for standing so strong in your faith and constantly as much trouble as I gave you, <laughs> loving me and reminding me of who Christ is. Then at that list also, I would be very wrong for not mentioning the second most important in my life, person in my life, and that would be my wife, Pam. I am a blessed man this day to have a woman who for 38 years of marriage has been one of the greatest partners you could ever have. Indeed, a pastor's wife like I don't know, like, who will love me as she has, challenge me when I needed to be challenged, lovingly confront me when I needed to be confronted, and comforted me in some of my most difficult moments of life. And so I thank her, I praise her for that, I thank her for bringing into this world, by God's grace, three glorious, wonderful children. Our daughter, Rebecca, our son, Josiah, and our daughter, Tori, three wonderful benedictions of God's blessing in our life, who has therefore enabled us to enjoy two more great benedictions of blessings in our life, and that is our two wonderful son-in-laws. And that is Philip and uh, Tyler, who have been the most godly, glorious men our daughters could have ever had, and who have, in turn, brought us four wonderful grandchildren that we are loving immensely at this stage of life. And we are so excited to welcome into our family Alyssa, who, before long, she will be Alyssa Hurt, and we are so thrilled about that. I just tell you that there is no greater joy in my heart than to stand before you today with this kind of family and people around me. I mean, the list goes on, my mother and my father-in-law. Without them, Pam would never be here. Without her, I would never be here. Without this, we would never have Grace Bible Church. They have played a fabulous part in our lives. My family, my brother, my sisters, and then our pastors and elders. What a privilege that we have in this church to have a history of good, godly men who have partnered to help us make Grace Bible Church what it is, and I'm so thankful for that. And to have from that group a man like Zach Ford to become our senior pastor, well, it's like a dream come true for me. And you as a congregation, I would be amiss if I didn't say thank you up front for all that you have done and all that you have been. I can tell you there's very few men who get to experience all the stages of life in their pastoral care as I have. To watch some of you who were young come to this church, have children who came to Christ, who then I had the privilege of marrying, who now have children, who we have the privilege of shepherding in this church. Just that whole stages of life has been a fabulous experience for me. And you know, it must have been something we did right when you find this on the door of your office this week. It says there, Pastor Kevin does a lot of fun with kids. He plays a lot. He teaches big kids on Sunday about a lot of stuff. He teaches about the Holy Spirit from the Bible. And so many sweet little notes like that just from these kids has been a very great treasure to me as I come to you this morning. You know, the greatest, greatest challenge for me, having taught through so many passages of Scripture, so many books of the Bible with you, uh, and I would love to list them, but time will not allow me to do that. But one of the greatest joys of having preached around 5,000 sermons in this church uh, is to get to come and preach this final one. And that presents a difficult challenge for me, and that is to try to figure out what do you preach on? What do you preach on? What do you say in a moment like this? And how do you challenge and install the next senior pastor in a way that it is indelibly marked in his heart and life? And so I think what will best serve us today is this passage in John chapter 13, and I want us to turn there as we are going to read the first 17 verses. And as we read these verses, if you are looking for your traditional outline in the bulletin to fill in the blanks, there is none of that today. I intentionally did that because I just want to preach my heart out to you today, share with you what this passage means to us and what it means for us really as we come to install Zach on this historic day of our church. 
Verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which, with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus said, answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, Not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one, one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. This morning as we come to this passage, it's amazing to me that we have here the King of glory, the Lord himself actually doing something that no one ever would have imagined he would have done. And in fact, in one sense, it doesn't even seem right that he would do something like this. After all, he is the king of glory. He is the one who made heaven and earth. He is the one who holds all things together by the word of his power. He is the sovereign God. And yet we find him taking on this role in this passage as a slave. And if you get anything from this today, you want to kind of get this idea in your head very clear at the beginning that right from the very beginning, what we have here is a picture of something that makes us very, very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable in the sense that when we hear the word slave, our minds go to all of these images of horrible treatment of people and those horrible treatments being wrong kind of treatments, enslaving people, boys and girls and women in kinds of torturous relationships and things that really abuse them. And we hear the word slave, we go, that just doesn't make sense to me that Jesus would say he's a slave. And yet this is the very term He calls himself. He is the master, and yet he wants to be referred to in this passage and seen in these final hours of his life as a slave. And I find that it's shocking to us that if we would want to pick a term for us as leaders or as God's people, we might feel more comfortable calling ourselves servants. Being a servant of God or a servant of Christ, it kind of has a a sense of of loyalty and a sense of somewhat being lifted up. I have the privilege of serving God as my God and Christ as my king. It's like we get something that that's really a a thing that we kind of get to do. It's kind of like a job. You get to serve a table or you get to serve in an industry and you get to serve for a company and it's kind of like some... Uh, sense of being elevated at that word. But when you think of the word slave, it kind of just seems to go down for us. And yet that is the very word that he has chosen. I found it really interesting as I went back through studying this topic again, that out of about 22 modern translations, there's only one translation that actually translates the Greek word doulos, which is what the word slave is, that way in their New Testament. 
As far back even as Calvin and John Knox in the Geneva Bible, they all translated the word doulos, which is slave, the word servant, because it really had a bad taste and a stigma in the minds of people. And yet that is what the Lord's chosen to call himself, a slave. And he says that the slave, you, he is not any greater than his master. He, in, he, in, he, in, he loved and he cherished being this on that evening. Now, to help us understand this passage, I think, and to see what we are doing here today as we think about what Jesus did, I think it's really important to kind of get your mind wrapped around an Old Testament passage for just a few moments that will help us understand what this doulos, what this slave really did and why he did what he did. I won't have you to turn there unless you want to, but in Exodus 21, you should note sometime that passage where there is a lengthy discussion on slaves and what it means to actually be a slave under the Old Testament economy. God lays out all of these kind of guidelines on how the slave was to be treated in, in that passage. And in the middle of that whole list of things about the slave and these regulations for his life, there is this fairly dramatic scene where the slave becomes a bond servant. And I think it vividly illustrates what it means to be this slave of Christ and what Christ is doing here today. I will just pick up for one of those verses for you and let you hear what it says. Now, these are the ordinances which you are to set before them. If you buy a Hebrew slave, you sh he shall serve for six years, but on the seventh he shall go out as a free man without payment. You see, in that day and time, sometimes people, because of debt, because of a need for a job, would become a slave in order to pay their bills, in order to have income in their life. And in this case, this guy, after six years, was free to go. He can leave. There's not going to be any cost to him. He is free to live his life the way he wants to if he's indentured himself as a slave. But something in the middle of that really actually happens to some of those slaves potentially after six years. There's this unusual option given in verse 5 and 6 that goes like this. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out as a free man. Then his master shall bring him to God. Then he shall bring him to the door of the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. At the end of those six years, he had the freedom to go and live his life any way he wanted to. But if he wanted to, he could, he could exercise this option to literally become a bond servant of his master. It's not a contractual agreement. It's not that he's hiring again for another six years. He is forever giving his life to this man to be his slave. It's like he is saying, I've got it so good here. My master loves me so much. He takes such great care of me. It would be my joy to give myself to him for the rest of my life, to live for his wishes, to follow his direction, to let him run my life. I will be his doulos. I will be his slave. I will be his bond servant. Now, what that obviously means, real quickly, is this. That would mean that you really must trust this guy. I mean, you think about this. You think of the job you have, whether you're a teacher or you're a builder or you're working at Burger King. How many of you are going to go to your boss and say, listen, I made up my mind. I know I could work anywhere I want to, but I'm going to be working for you the rest of my life. You would have to trust those people. So obviously, his master must be a good master, and he loved his master, and he trusted his master. He did not want to go out free. Not only does it mean that, it meant that he was going to let everybody know publicly this was a sign of ownership. The sign of the covenant in this public ceremony is he brought him before God. Everybody got to see it. Everybody saw that this guy who literally wanted to give his life as a slave to his master because he was good for the rest of his life, nobody would see it, though it was done in secret. They would know it was done publicly for all to see and how you would know that he was forever going to be the slave was they would pierce his ear with a hole and so it didn't matter wherever he went if he decided that hey I don't like this job anymore I'm going to leave it everybody would know he had become a slave for life because of the hole in his ear no matter if he got tired or weary no matter where he went his friends his family everyone would see this permanent visible sign that he belonged to his master and it was a relationship that was voluntary. 
He wasn't coerced to do this. He wasn't pressured to do this. He could have gone free, but he chose to actually say, I want to serve this man. It's one that was a relationship, a, a relationship of love, a relationship of s such satisfaction with his master that he couldn't think of anything else but doing whatever he wanted him to do. And it was permanent. He couldn't leave his job one day or change his mind because he would forever be marked with this hole in his ear. Now here is the amazing, dramatic, humbling reality about this unusual option in Exodus 21. Nowhere in the entire Old Testament or in historical records did anyone ever do it. Never. And you have to ask yourself, why in the world would God himself give this kind of regulation in Exodus 21 and show us this kind of abrupt scenario that could take place in a slave's life and no one had ever done it? Here is why. Because just like in the Old Testament, so much points us to our Savior. Interestingly, in the Old Testament, in Psalm 40 verses 6 and 8 Jesus said sacrifice and offering you did not desire but my ears you have pierced some translations say you have opened my ears I he says desire to do your will O my God and in the New Testament how is it that Paul describes Christ he says he emptied himself taking the form of a bond servant there it is again the doulos the slave in obedience to his father, what Jesus is saying is that he had come to do what his father's will was. He had come to serve him. He loved his father. He wanted to please his father. In short, he was the savior who came to be known as the man with the hole in his ear. And when he does that, we find him coming in John chapter 13, showing us what it looks like to be a slave, to be a a servant. So let's quickly walk through this passage and understand what John saw and what John has on his mind and how it's going to help us today as we think about the installation of our next pastor. In verse 1, you'll notice that in this scene that we have here, this is a not a teaching moment in the sense that Jesus is teaching or preaching like he was on the Sermon on the Mount. This is, as it were, a living object lesson. This is an example that they're going to never forget in their lives. And as this happens in verse 1 to 3, John has two things that stand out to him. He says, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world, he knows he's about to go to the cross. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. John says, when I remember that night, when this doulos, this slave, this savior with as it were, not literally, but spiritually speaking, was the man with the hole in his ear who gave himself to this kind of slavery. When I remember that what stands out here is the unloving, unchanging love of Christ. He loved them to the end. That doesn't mean he just loved them to a point and then he was done. The word means he loved them to the highest possible degree. And you see that he loved them to the highest possible degree because when he's about to go to the cross, who does he have on his mind? Does he have himself and the sorrows that is before him? No, he has his own disciples. That's what amazed John. I can't get over, John says, the fact that he loved us to the highest possible degree. And in verses 2 and 3, having known that the devil had already put into the heart of Judas to betray him, it says in verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. Not only did John see here this amazing, unchanging love that he would put his thoughts on his disciples in the darkest, hardest hours of his life, but ultimately he saw here that Jesus knew that God was ultimately in control of his life. He had come from him, he was going back to him, and that nothing could stop that. And yet here this king, this great glorious king, is the one who is going to take a towel and a bowl of water and get on his knees and wash the disciples' feet. Now I don't know about you, but if I were a king, I would probably think of another symbol to use to show my kingship. 
I would probably set me up a throne. I would probably get me a scepter. And I would have a lot of people fanning and singing and celebrating my greatness. That's what kings do. But this king, because back in the Old Testament, having been prophesied about having his ears pierced through, took a towel, took up water, and he took on the role of a slave. So watch real quickly what happens in this pastor pa passage. The picture here is a picture that represents his life. Verse 4, he got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. He poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he, with which he was girded. And at the end of that, he's going to ask them, verse 12, so when he had washed their feet and, then, and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? Did you get it? Did you learn? Did the picture sink into you? This wasn't a stand-up teaching sermon. This wasn't a Sunday school class. This was a lesson lived out, a very parabolic lesson for them to grasp. And he says, did you get it? Do you understand? I am your king. I am your master. But this is what I've done. And I hope you get what it's saying to you. It's interesting when I think of how Paul describes the very life of Christ coming into this world and what he did. It's almost like this is illustrating what Paul is going to describe to us about his life in Philippians chapter 2 verses 7 and 8. It says in the passage that Jesus first rose from supper just as he rose from his glorious throne in heaven to come into our world. And then the passage in John 13 says he laid aside his garment and Paul tells us in Philippians 2 that he laid aside his glory when he came into the world to incarnate himself. When he laid aside the exercise of that deity, he was as it were putting aside his garment of glory, just putting it aside for that season. And he girded himself with a towel and Paul says that he took on the form of a servant just as he did here. And he humbled himself and he became obedient to death. And then he poured water into the basin. And in one sense, kind of a reminder that he's going to do through his service and sacrifice of his life, provide a way to wash and cleanse us from our sin. And then he began to wash their feet and to wipe them, reminding us that there's only one way and only one person that can cleanse our lives from our sin. And in verse 12, when he had finished that, it says he took his garments and he went back. And that's exactly what Paul says, that he had been raised up on high and seated on high so that his name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And apparently the disciples got it, right? They must have got it because he says right now you don't know what I'm telling you, what I'm showing you, but you will later get it. In fact, if you go through their lives, you will find that all of them keep calling themselves what? Slaves. Paul said he was a slave of Jesus Christ in Romans 1.1. James said that he was a slave, the doulos of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. And Jude says the very same thing, that he is a slave of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if you get this or not, but we just saw two brothers, half-brothers there, James and Jude, who are the half-brothers of Jesus, right? And think about this. If you grew up in the house with Jesus, if you actually ate at the same table, played in the same sandbox, ate at the same dinner table each night, and you went to church together, you probably wouldn't write somebody and call yourself a slave. You would write somebody and say, hey, do you know who I am? This is my half-brother here. But they saw it as a badge of honor and cherished the very fact that they could be like their master and be a slave. And Peter does the same thing. A slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And I don't think it just stops with them. I think it should go all the way through the history of our lives. One of my favorite stories is a man by the name of Joseph Son. He, his name is spelled T-S-O-N if you ever want to read about him. He is a Romanian, and he is a guy who realized what it was to actually be a slave of Jesus Christ. Here's a brilliant man. He's an Oxford-educated man. He's a scholar. He's articulate. He's a philosopher, a theologian, and he has all this academic and professional credentials. And yet, when he was in Romania as a pastor, he was persecuted and fled, and God just spared his life in miraculous ways and used him in wonderful ways. And when he began to tell his story, Joseph's son said, when you introduce me, here's how I want you to introduce me. Not with my credentials, not with all my, the accolades of my life. I want you to introduce me as the slave of Jesus Christ. That's how I want to be known, as a slave. So that's the picture. That's the picture of Christ's life. That's the picture of what it should mean for our lives. 
And yet we know that that is not what they saw at that point. At that point, what they realized is that they were people filled with pride. Just look as you have read, and you know the passage in verses 6 through 11. Jesus comes to Peter, and Peter resists him washing his feet. It looks like Peter is being humble, saying, no, Lord, don't, don't wash my feet. I mean, you, you shouldn't do that. But really what Peter is doing is showing us how prideful he is and how prideful we all are. Because none of us like to be brought low to the place of humility. None of us feel that this is something that really we should experience like this, and particularly not the Savior doing this. And what a revelation in this passage here that he is showing us that what the gospel and what Christ is constantly trying to do is to bring us to a place of humility. To push away our pride, I'm okay, I don't need that. And to say, Lord, I need you. Yes, I need you. Every hour, I need you. It's a picture here again of what, what the gospel does in our life. It first cleanses us. It washes us all. Because Peter said, well, if, you're gonna, if I'm not with you without the washing, then just wash me all over. And Jesus said, you don't need washing all over. It's like salvation. You have been saved. You've been justified. You've been regenerated. You are clean, but you get your feet defiled and dirty in life. And you need continually to realize how helpless you are and needy you are of the Savior's cleansing. And it's our pride that needs to be crushed initially when we hear the gospel to bring us to the Savior and to realize that, Lord, there is nothing in my life I can offer you. Everything in my life deserves the opposite of what you would be to me. I deserve the judgment and the punishment for my sin, but you loved me, died for me. You bore my sin on the cross. You took the wrath my sin deserved. It's the songs we sing and we relish and we rejoice in. Because it reminds us that we, in our sin and our brokenness, find cleansing only in Christ. And yet we all know that just like Peter, our feet get dirty. And we need to be clean over and over again. And in fact, Jesus says that if we do this, that's where it proves we are really with him. We are part of him. We are his. You see, a Christian isn't someone who just maybe decides somewhere in the past, hey, I want to be a Christian and then goes on and lives life. No, a Christian is someone who has come to Christ. They know their sin. They've humbled themselves before that great God and trusted Christ for cleansing and forgiveness through the shed blood of Christ. They repented and trusted him. And yet they realize that daily, constantly, there's a reminder of their sin and they need him and they keep clinging to him for cleansing and for him to make them what they're supposed to be. That's the picture. That's the pride that was in their life. What's the point of all of this as we wrap this up? The point of all of this is to remind us, if your master, your master, Christ, this king of glory, humbled himself and served like this, ought you and I not be the same in our lives? So I want to challenge you. This is my challenge and then my charge to Zach. In verses 12 through 15, notice what it says. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you all should, also should do as I did to you. Please don't worry, there's going to be no foot washing here today. But it is a strong reminder. And my challenge to you as God's people and the members of Grace Bible Church and any of those who are here with us today as believers, I want you to passionately live your life as a man or a woman, as a boy or a girl, young or old, with the prayer on your lips, Lord, like you, make me a man or a woman with a hole in my ear. Make me like you. Make me like you. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, we sing, I give myself to thee, for thou in thine atonement did give thyself for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Can I just charge you? You have been such a loyal, faithful, glorious people to shepherd, to give that continual kind of living in life before our next pastor, 
to really say, I am a man, I am a woman with the hold in my ear, and I want to be known as the slave of Christ. That means you remember why you were created. You can't set the agenda for your life. You can't plan your life the way you want it. You can't determine what you will or you won't do. You say, Lord, here am I. Take me. I am your slave. I want you to use me in the way that you want to use me. And you know what that means when you live like that. Is that he is going to rearrange your world in ways you never imagined. He's going to interrupt your plan and you are going to surrender your to-do list to him over and over again and say, it's not my will, it's yours. That's how you lived. That's how I'm going to live. That's how you and why you created me. So when he interrupts your daily plan, when he calls you to serve in ways that really you are not comfortable with, that means as a slave of Christ, you say, I will do it. And I think if you love him, that's not hard to do. When you really love someone, like this slave in the Old Testament was given this opportunity, if you really love him, then it doesn't become hard to live your life like that. It may mean that you have to embrace some hard times that the Lord brings into your life. He may bring things that are difficult, a marriage, a child, a job, a health thing. But yet as the slave, you say, Lord, be it unto me as you will. Thy will be done. It's not easy, it's not comfortable, but it is what it means to live that way. It means not only do we realize what we are created for, it means we embrace the assignment that the master has given us. Whatever he calls us to do, to move us out of our comfort zone. For some of you, that means you might need to step up to an area of teaching and serving in this church that maybe you've been saying, I'm not ready to do that yet. It's a challenge and a call to us as we go forward to remember that he may just call us and set the agenda to something other than what we are naturally and normally comfortable with. He may call you to represent him like you've never had before in your workplace that is antagonistic to the gospel. It may mean cutting back your living expenses so you can give more generously to the work that the Lord has called us to. The list goes on and on and on. But whatever he puts you in, whatever circumstance he gives you, that is the opportunity for you to be like the master and be a slave. It means, in, in conclusion, we serve at the pleasure of our king. Don't you love that phrase? We hear it all the time in business worlds. We hear it in politics. I serve at the pl pleasure of my president. I serve at the, the pleasure of the office of the college. This is us saying, I serve at the pleasure of. That means they get to set the agenda for me. We serve at the pleasure of our king. And I want you to think for just a moment, what is he calling you to, church? What is he calling you to say, yes, Lord, I am a man or a woman with a hole in my ear. I'm your slave. Now that leads me to the last few moments of our time. I'm going to ask Pastor Zach to come. And I'm just going to have him to stand before us as our senior pastor. Nothing uncomfortable, nothing strange going to happen here. <laughs> yes. No all, no pin, no holes in the ear. No nothing. I want you to hear what Jesus then turned and said to them. Verse 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. You see, in leadership, Zach, God reminds us that we are called to serve like our master served. And any time we throw away the towel, we throw away the basin, we tell ourselves we're better than him. And so think often, if you will, in your ministry, how Jesus served at the most uncomfortable, difficult times of his life. He served when he was tired. He served when he had rather be alone. He served when he was sad. He served when he had been serving nonstop for days. He served others when things were terribly wrong, went wrong in his own world around him. And he served others when he knew his own death was right around the corner. There really is no higher calling, I think, than as a pastor to be known as a slave like Christ. Verse 17, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. You're not blessed because you know the passage. 
You're not blessed because you can exegete the text. You're blessed because you do it. He will bless you, Zach, not because of your intelligence, and you are one smart guy. He will bless you not because of your education, and you have a great one. He's going to bless you not because of your organizational and planning skills, and you are very gifted in that way. He's not going to bless you because you learn to speak well and prepare sermons well, and you do a fabulous job too. He's not going to bless you because of your writing skills. He will bless you, and he will bless this church because you embrace the bowl and the towel as a symbol of your life and your ministry. So I'm going to ask you as I charge you today, Zachary Tyler Ford, as you stand before your congregation, will you accept this call from your master, the Lord himself, to serve as the senior pastor and be a slave like your master? If you will do that, brother, would you give us a yes? Amen. Yes. I'm going to ask... I'm going to ask our elders to come. At this time, Zach, if you will come, we are going to pray for you. And then we want to present something to you. If you will stand in the middle here. You stand right here for us. Okay. I'm going to ask you, Jim, if you will step to the podium and pray for Zach. And Will, if you will, then I will close us in prayer. Father, this morning, I just want to thank you so much for what this day represents in so many ways for both Kevin and Zach. And as we lift uh, Zach up at this time, Father, I just want to pray what uh, Timothy wrote to, or what Paul wrote to Timothy and what he probably prayed for Timothy. So I just want to repeat that, and I pray this for Zach. I pray that you would help him to set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith and in purity, and I pray that you would impress that responsibility upon his heart. Father, I pray that you would help him to devote himself to the public reading of the scriptures, to exhortation, to teaching, and I pray, God, that you would continue to develop those gifts and those disciplines in him. Father, I pray that you would help him to practice these things, to immerse himself in them, that others may see his progress, and I pray that you would help him to keep a close watch on his teaching and I pray Father that you would help him to do as has been done for these 32 years to guard the gospel above all else may he not give sway one iota to any assault on the gospel of Christ grace alone through faith alone the doctrine of justification I pray God that you would help him and us around him to protect that in this ministry as he moves forward as senior pastor and then Father I pray that you would help him to persist in this for your word says that by so doing, he will save himself and his hearers. And I pray that last little phrase would bear on his heart the importance of the task that is set before him. In your name, amen. Lord, we thank you. Thank you again for this ministry, Grace Bible Church. It's your ministry. And Lord, as uh, Zach takes over at the helm of this ministry. We just pray for him that uh, he would be guided and directed by you. You would control his footsteps. We pray that you would protect him spiritually and Brittany. Just, uh, Lord, we know that the, the uh, evil one is out there and would like nothing better than to get involved in this church and uh, lead uh, his ministry astray. But pray, we, we do pray that you will just continue to watch over him, guide him, direct him, and we give you all the praise that he will lead Grace Bible Church for another undetermined time. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I thank you for the most incredible gift you've given to my life a friendship in Zach, a fellow shepherd and pastor, the privilege of pouring into his life and the privilege of him even challenging and sharpening me in these final days of my life, and I thank you for it. And so we commit him and we commit ourselves as a church 
to follow you, to allow you to lead us and direct our paths in such a way that will deepen our servitude and our love for Christ and our honor for our pastor. We pray all this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wait right here. So, um, so that Zach will forever remember this passage and this day, we have a towel that's here that says, A slave is not greater than his master from John 13, 16, a bowl that has been placed in the shadow box, and the words it says, Zachary, Zach Tyler Ford, installed as the second senior pastor of Grace Bible Church, March 01, 2020. Congratulations, my friend. <laughs> yeah.